Hello, and welcome to Horror Movies and Shit. I'm your host, Jim, and with me as always is... Mark. Mark, how are you today? Living the dream. I hate that, and it makes me want to punch babies. Don't ever say that again. I, I know that's why I say it all the time. <laughs> Mark, we have a special guest with us today. Do you want to introduce him? Sorry? Uh, we do. Um, Joshua, maybe you want to introduce yourself and um, talk no, about... No, 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 no. That's so bougie. We'll, we'll introduce him. I actually know about him. Do you? Oh, off, Jim. Jesus. <laughs> See what I have to put up with. <laughs> well, I'm happy to introduce myself. I don't mind. Um, my name is Joshua Marcella, and I'm a Maine-based horror author, and I've been writing in the horror genre for going on four years. Um, and I'm I'm on TikTok, and that's about it. I, I'm excited to be here with these guys. I'm a huge horror movies and shit fan, um, yeah. meaning I love horror movies and shit, so I feel like I'm a great, great <laughs> guest to have on. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he means he's a big fan of horror movies and shit, not the podcast. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> both, he's both. probably seen, so yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so, so, Joshua, just before our audience asks, you are not Stephen King in disguise, is that correct? I am not. Um, I okay. don't even have probably... One thousandth of his money, um, <laughs> but if you would like to help, go commit uh, contribute to that. Um, you're welcome to buy ten thousand of my books um, <laughs> to get get the ball rolling, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> so, Mark, a little backstory on on uh, how I came across Joshua. I followed him when he first started posting on TikTok, and then I started the horror movies and shit TikTok, and immediately started following him again because he posts funny stuff. It, it's not all just about his books. But let's see if I can get this right, Josh. It, it started off with Hunger for Death, right? Nope. Um, no? Which actually, one was first? first... <laughs> oh, look, I fucked up already. <laughs> it's all good. Um, my first book came out um, in the very beginning of the pandemic. I started writing uh, Scratches, and it was originally oh. a short story um, that was inspired I inspired to write, start writing when I was inspired to start writing when I went to a book signing um, with Richard Chismar and his son up in Bangor, Maine. And, oh, okay. you know, I kind of was like, man, I could do this thing. And I was reading a lot back then and started writing scratches and um, started off as a short story. And it kind of evolved into a novella, as sometimes these things do, and had no idea what I was doing. Um and I self-published it in May of 2020, and that kind of uh, got the ball rolling. And yeah, so um, I, I wrote Severed after that, which is a prequel to The Scratches, yep. and I believe you've read that. And I've read both Hunger of those, for yeah. Death. Yeah, and, and during the time I was writing both of these, I was writing short stories and submitting short stories to publishers and stuff. And um, that's when I put together... 13 short stories and published Hunger for Death, which is um, my short story collection. I believe that came out in 2021. Um, those first couple of years were very busy for me. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I've slowed down over the past year, but I'm still, I still have a lot in the works. It's just my kids are a little older now and, and time is uh, constrained a little bit, but I'm still hard at work putting more, trying to put more work out there. So, well, you do have, you have one more collection, right? Hymns from the Dirt. Yeah, yeah. So uh, October, I what I kind of did was I had a lot of short stories that were on in contracts uh, with with uh, a lot of these indie publishers that are out now, and the contracts were either finished up or uh, they were charity um, anthologies. So what I did was I put together another collection of eight short stories, and what I didn't, what else, what the other ones I didn't have, I added some new short stories in there. So some of them are older, some of them are newer. But to anyone who's never read my work, they're all going to be new to you. Um, yeah, and that came out on October 13th, uh, Hymns from the Dirt, and it's been doing really well. And I've just started promoting more on TikTok now because the hardest thing as an author isn't necessarily the writing, it's the marketing. And mm -hmm. I figured if I can get people to learn about me and who I am as a person on TikTok and make them laugh, maybe they'll be interested in checking out my books and I think they'll be pleasantly surprised that my books aren't all hee hee and ha ha and, and lip syncing. It's actually, uh, there's some serious work there and, yep. um, I love horror and that's kind of like the, 
what what all came to be was that so uh yeah so that's uh, what i'm doing now is just kind of trying to build a name for myself so if i'm if i remember correctly which clearly my memory sucks because <laughs> i've already been wrong twice right um you you had a different cover on hymns for the dirt originally right yes yeah, so i had bought a cover and i'm not going to go into like details about it but i had yeah, bought no. a cover off off an author um earlier that year and um they said you know they said once you get a title give it to me and I'll, I'll put it on the cover and then lo and behold they like a year later almost had messaged me in an email and said hey by the way uh that cover was ai generated and i know a lot of people are against ai so um if you don't like if you don't want to use that you know let me know or whatever and that kind of irked me a little bit so i ended up just designing my own cover and I took some photos I, I had of uh, Popham Beach here in Maine that I took um, beautiful black and white photos kind of rendered them a little bit and and uh, added some things that are featured in one of my stories and like the lighthouse and the ship in the background and made my own cover and I'm kind of going that route now I do all my own publishing through my press called Cold Hands Press and I do everything but the formatting so i do the writing the formatting i mean i'm sorry everything but the editing the cover art the formatting the um story writing and all that stuff so kind of a one-man show with my my editor um who i send my books off to and stuff like that friend of mine so yeah it's uh that's kind of what happened and it's 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 been going great so far yeah um josh i i really think that the marketing is a big thing right i mean Whenever you yeah. look at self-publishing, I mean, that's just kind of, it's kind of like when the fan footage thing happened, right? In movies. And then everybody yeah. with, with, with a camera could just release something, right? And, um, you know, it's straight to video or, you know, on-demand streaming now. And it, it's just yeah. really opened it up. But what that means is there's so much more content out there. Um, yeah. But I was thinking about this, but even prior to that, right? So, like, if I go to Barnes & Noble... I go to the horror section in Barnes and Noble. There's like four shelves of Stephen King things, <laughs> books, mm -hmm. and then just like a handful of other authors. So yes. it, it like it, it's the horror mainstream, um, like marketing and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's almost like you have to be niche or not niche. Right. Because if you're trying to be that sort of you know, big famous author, it's almost like nobody wants to read you because they just want to stay with what they know, which is fair enough. But um, I, I, I think the marketing is such an important thing right now, just even to get your idea of your book out there, right? And somebody's like, huh, that sounds pretty interesting. I'll, 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 I'll pick that up because I like the idea, right? You might know anything about you or how you write or anything, but that's why I look at, like, uh, media I consume. Do I like the idea? Yeah. I'll go and uh, check it out and maybe I'll like it. Maybe I won't, but um, yeah. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And I think a big part of it nowadays is a lot of doors have been opened up for people, um, not just in, in writing, but like you mentioned, found footage and a lot of these indie um, movie companies coming out that are putting out some really quality work. Um, but to your point about the marketing horror stuff, um, traditional publishing does not want horror unless it is Stephen King or, and a lot of times they will try to shoehorn you into, well, let's call it a thriller. Let's call it this. And wow. they'll try to put it into another genre. Like even when you go to Audible, I believe, <clears throat> I don't even think they have a horror section necessarily, but if you go to find Stephen King, you'll find him in thriller yes. or, you know what I mean? And I, it, we're kind of in this, in this, like period of it's it's almost like a horror uh renaissance where you have a massive influx of um new fresh horror authors of all walks of life that are finally getting a chance you know we grew up reading stephen king and um clive barker and all these mm -hmm. amazing talented guys but they're kind of you know now that's like this influx of talent that's coming into the market and you're starting to see them finally getting picked up by uh, traditional publishers. And, and not only that, you're starting to see the horror sections at Barnes and Noble and other bookstores growing 
Um, they're not necessarily pushing out Stephen King, but they're actually getting three, four, five shelves now because they kind of realize, wow, there's some serious talent out there. And um, and and it whether you go the indie route or the the self publishing route or the traditional route, um, you know, the the TikTok and social media has been a huge um, positive thing for you know uh, indie authors and authors in general because. You know, at this point, we're kind of all now that these older guys are aging out. We're we're kind of getting to be on an even playing field, and you're seeing more authors who are independent uh, getting, you know, getting attention. And, and you can have one thing go viral, and you can sell thousands of books off that video. And it's and that's you you literally hear some authors being like, "Okay, so I'm doing this, and just waiting for that one video to go viral, so people finally notice my book." And um, it's funny, but it's 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 true. That can really be a game changer. Sometimes you can get, you know, you have one video go viral, and you get you get a note of um, a letter from a agent or a, a publisher wants to pick you up now. And and opportunities can arise from. I mean, we saw it with Justin Bieber in the early two thousands mm -hmm. doing YouTube videos, and now he's like this global sensation. Um, it's kind of that idea of um, there's a lot more opportunities there. We're not snail mailing manuscripts to publishers who ignore you um because you're not you know you, you're not this specific you know right cookie and, and, cutter per, you know writer and i think if you go back to like kind of the you know the start of the internet whenever it became sort of bigger if you look at the movies that did well they tend to be horror movies you look at like um blair witch project right who yep. fully they fully understood the internet at that time <laughs> um as far as right. you could plan and they knew how to market right and they knew how to market that well um they still had some of the uh you know sci-fi channel doing this or that but it was really more an online thing um and then you can go to another like i don't want to stick with all found footage but it tends to be the the cheaper um independent like uh paranormal activity and they had the big thing about, hey, you know, uh, write to your local theater or, or write, you know, whatever, so that, you know, we have, you can see it on the big screen. So there's a lot of that sort of energy, which uh, it, it's a little weird because I, I, I look at kind of like, you know, what was popular, like in the media consumption, you know, you get a lot of, you know, action adventure um, some sci-fi, but I think horror is right up there. I, I, I think a lot of places sleep on horror, really. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, and none, none more so than like publishing, I'd say, because uh, you're starting to even see movie companies and stuff really, uh, like A24 and even mm -hmm. Warner Brothers. I mean, they when they released the uh, It Chapter One and Two, I mean that was I think the biggest uh, box office release of any horror movie ever. And yep. it kind of it was like eye opening for these these companies to be like, OK, so maybe there is a market for this stuff. And it's not just, um, you know, these horror B movies that you see all the time coming out. Now you're starting to see big production companies um, coming out with some very, very good quality horror. And I, I mentioned A24 a lot just because I love their work so much. But it's it's not just them. Um, there's a lot of other um, even some of the bigger production companies are finally getting into it and. Uh, funding, you know, and, and sometimes they're hit or miss. I'm a big fan of the indie scene. Um, and like you mentioned, found footage and stuff. I love that type of stuff um, because it kind of reminds me of myself a little bit out there just trying to tell a, a story and getting putting your work out there. And even like uh, I think of the film Lake Mungo that came mm -hmm. out, uh, mm -hmm. geez, I'm like almost 20 years ago now. Didn't really catch uh, any attention until, I mean, a decade or two later when um it came out on tubi and a couple of these other places and people were like wow man this movie was great it was just really you know un it's made me uneasy and stuff but it's like but those things have been here for such a long time but just nobody noticed it because of how it was marketed or the production company that put it out so i honestly feel like word of mouth and social media has been a huge boost to the genre in general and um you know that's where i find a lot of my movies like like folks like you or even like horror horror book talkers uh horror talkers and stuff some right. of these movies that are out now i don't even know about and i'm like oh that sounds really good you know and, and here's the other thing i think for a while um you got a lot of the um the you know the cinema tends to go in like cycles it's a zombie thing or this or that 
Um, and I think with the It um, movie recently, and maybe things like Terrifier, I think that they're starting to understand, hey, we don't just have to release PG-13 movies, right? Horror right. movies. We can still release like an R-rated movie. Uh, we can make a lot of money from that as long as it's done well, right? Um, yeah. Or even marketed well, right? <laughs> it doesn't even have to be done well. As long as you market it well, you'll get people to see it, right? Um, for yeah. sure. Uh, but that's the double-sided sword of social media, right? So you got you look at um, what came, like Madam Web that came out. <laughs> Which, yes. but, you know, I I really like uh, Dakota. Johnson, Johnson, Dakota Johnson, because I yeah. liked her in the Suspiria remake, and I would have been interested to see that. But like, it's just got like horrible, 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 horrible reviews. I'm like, I'll wait, I'll wait until it comes on some sort of free streaming thing. So, um, yeah, yeah like said, it's, it's like a it's like a double edged sword because it's like right. you do have these companies that are able to put out these huge budget movies, but that doesn't mean that's going to be a quality movie. Like some of the better horror movies out there are coming out with no CGI or very little unrecognizable CGI. And um, that, that's kind of what I'm waiting for is the uh, practical effects renaissance to, to start up again and to get right. back into that 80s, you know, the 80s generation of the the um, John Carpenter movies and stuff like that mm -hmm. when it was it was unsettling because it was real and it was there and it was, although it was makeup and, and clay and rubber and all these things, it still was real. It wasn't computerized. And, and uh, that's what I'm, I'm excited for that. I'm hoping we start to see that come up again. real yeah. soon. You see that with terrifier. That's, that's sort of the big draw yes. with the first movie was that nine, 95 to 96% of the special effects were all practical. That was the draw to that movie because the, yep. Un unabashedly that movie is terrible the acting is terrible the script is terrible art the clown is definitely terrifying but the immediate draw is the practical effects yep and yeah I, and you know with cgi I, I think cgi and practical effects i think they all have their place right um mm -hmm. like you, you can make some beautiful backgrounds and everything else in cgi but when you get to characters you know, they still have that weight problem where they don't seem to have a lot of weight yeah. <laughs> to them, whereas practical effects do. Ray, um, Ray and yeah. I just had this conversation this weekend because he made me watch Aquaman, The Lost Kingdom. And I told uh -huh. him, I hate I hate this movie because I feel like I'm watching a cartoon. Yes. This, th th this is 95% CGI. All you get are actors' faces through the entire movie. But you know, you know, I, I think if there's a good movie there or a good story, even if you have bad effects, whether they're bad practical effects or what comes to mind as far as bad CGI effects is like Deep Rising, right. which is yeah. just which is just such a fun movie. It is. And does it does it hold up now? Or did it even look good then? No. <laughs> but you know, you, you kind of look past that and you're like, these are fun characters and these are like just a you know, popcorn flick, and it's fine. Well, yeah, I mean, but because, like, with the Meg, right? All no, the shark's all CGI, but it was a fun movie. It was no, a it fun, wasn't. stupid movie. It wasn't a fun movie. Joshua, would you care to, <laughs> to weigh in on that? I have never seen the Meg. My son, who's six years old, actually has seen more of the Meg than I have. Um, and I don't know. I just don't. I don't have a, a very good relationship with. Statham, I think Jason yeah. Statham, whatever his name Jason is. Jason Statham. He just <laughs> the one accent Mark can do. That's his specialty, that one accent. Uh, Mark actually posted a question in our Facebook group. So we have two questions for you, Josh. Yeah. Um, the first one is from Sarah Miley Cooper. She asks, uh, when you're writing, do you start at the end and work your way back? Or do you let the story evolve as you write? Oh, good question. Um, most definitely, uh, the story evolves as I write. Um, like, I, I always go to Scratches as my example, because that started out as a simple story about a young a, a boy who moves his room into the basement, which is essentially my story. I, I was that kid who moved my room into the basement. Me too. I lived with my mom and two sisters, and I wanted some privacy, and I hung mm -hmm. up sheets on yep. the as walls and all these different things. And the original story was... He 
he's sleeping at night and because I lived literally like 20 feet from a cemetery. And oh, wow. if you do the math, you know, I'm sleeping in the basement and 20 feet away from me is a is these corpses and coffins. You know what I mean? So right. my, my original story was he hears scratching on the exterior of the foundation and he doesn't know what it is and it's creeping him out. And, and anyway, and it evolved from there. But when I started writing it, it, you know, it just, it something else completely came out. Um, and it was a story about a boy and his mom. And then there's the backstory of the grandfather that comes in and yep. all of that kind of took on a life of its own. And, and, uh, his grandfather's, um, military background and all these different things all came out of, the writing process. I never planned these things. And sometimes even after you write something and you go back, you're like, man, I don't even remember writing that because, and I don't even know where that came from because I don't, I had no idea, you know, and that's why it's, I don't do it, but it, it can be fun to like, if you have to go back and read something that you wrote before, because you, it's like almost after a certain period of time passes, it's like new to you. Cause you're like, man, I don't even remember writing that, but it is very much, um, you might have a tiny little bit of an idea. Um, you're like, man, that would be a cool idea for a story. And then you start writing it and either you stick with that idea and it comes to life um, or in surprising ways or it it evolves into something completely different. Um, you may have like the, you know, the big twist at the end in mind when you're first writing it. But generally, um, for me anyway, it's it's kind of the process that, that takes over and that's where, you know, the whole story comes and and it's funny because when you, most writers when you ask them where do you get your ideas or or where do you know and they'll tell you it's like this cosmic almost religious thing where you don't know something takes over your body and when you're writing it it you know i'm sure it's the same with like musicians and artists and stuff it's like you you were just the vehicle for the story or this piece of art and um you're not really in charge of what's happening because it is it's like you go into this like almost like this trance and as you're writing it and um, well, that's kind of how it is for me. Like I, I, I write it and whatever ha comes out happens. And then, you know, in the, in the editing process and the revision process, you can add, add things and make changes and stuff, but it's, it's almost just as fun for us as right. it is for the people reading it, especially the first time you're writing it, because it's like, man, I didn't even know I had that in me, or I didn't even know that was going to happen, you know, and it's, it, it's pretty cool, but that's kind of how it works for me anyway. Nice. So. Yeah. We have one other question from somebody we both know, Josh, is uh, Tim King. Yeah. He wants mm -hmm. to know, of of your four books, where would you have somebody start with your work? I always recommend Hunger for Death. Um, it's, it's 13 stories. It's a little bit of my earlier work and mid, mid like, t level work. Um, the stories in there, I'm very proud of. They're very, they're diverse in the sense that um, they're all very different. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like you can get a good idea of not only my writing style, but my storytelling style um, in in there. And, and, you know, it covers a lot of different things. There's, there's some like more sci-fi type stories in there. There's some grief horror in there. And I say I write horror, um, but it's very, you know, some stories can be, like I said, more sci-fi, more thriller, revenge type story. Um, some of them have literal like monsters or cannibals or things. But um, I feel like Hunger for Death is definitely a good starting point for anybody. And then if they like that, I I, I kind of say go and read anything else. But what I the only thing I do say is if you're going to read my first two novellas, uh, read scratches first and then read severed. That's um, exactly what reasons. I told them. Yeah. You'll, you'll know why when you read them, but yep. even though severed is a prequel, um, you definitely want to read that after it's kind of like, yep. um, it's like a companion piece. Like you read that and then you'll understand, um, it make, severed it will the, be that much more impactful, you know, when yeah, you read it that, that way. And that's exactly what I told him. I said, if you're going to read, if you're going to read these two read scratches first, because it makes severed hit different. Yeah, and it and a lot of people um, have said, especially people that are reading it a lot more now, they say, "Man, I didn't, you know, you totally threw me for a loop in the sense that you feel this one way about a certain character, and then you mm -hmm. feel completely opposite 
by the time you're done reading Severed. And um, a lot of people are like, well, why do I need to read a prequel when I already know what's going to happen and stuff? And this is one of those rare instances where it actually it it is worth your time and yep. because you don't necessarily actually know what's going to happen, even though you think you do. Um, right. And they're two very different books. Uh, they are. Scratches is uh, kind of like a coming of age, mother and son, um, you know, trauma story and mm -hmm. very, very little gore. There may be like a speck of blood in the whole book. I mean, I don't even yep. know. But and then Severed is a flashback into 1967 Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a my uh, old friend of mine said it's kind of like The Exorcist meets Predator. And mm -hmm. I think that's a very good, uh, um, you know, I think that's a good way of putting it. But it's character driven. There's more characters yep. and it's very it's very bloody. Um, it's not over the top gore. Like mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's extreme horror, but it, it fits the you know, it, 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 it's impactful because the gore is is these characters that, you know, is on these characters that you grow to enjoy and like and mm -hmm. feel for, you know, so. It's two yeah. totally different books, but they directly connect by the yep. time you're done reading them, you know? Yep, you're absolutely right. They have two different, completely different tones to them. I, and I, I love them both. Yep. I'm I'm not a big short story fan, so I haven't read the other your other two works yet, but those two novellas yeah. were, were great. And I um, feel like if you like those novellas, you'll definitely dig the short stories because they're very much my style. And yep. I, because I... I have a hard time with short stories because sometimes when you read a single author collection, they're very cookie cutter. They're very mm -hmm. similar in style. Um, one thing I'm very proud of is my stories are all very different and they, they're, I write like I have, I have ADHD and I mm -hmm. write almost like frantically. Like when I write, I don't add a lot of filler in my stories. Everything has a purpose in the story. Um, and sometimes with short stories, people like to add a bunch of unnecessary stuff to drag it out. And that's what pulls me out of the story. So when I started writing, I kind of like, okay, this is me. I can do my own thing. I can do what I want. And I'm going to write like my ass is on fire. And that's kind of what I do. And it seems to work for people and they seem to really enjoy the, the collections. So, um, yeah. I'm and not that I want to like uh, keep referencing other authors, but it kind of sounds like um, Barker's Books of Blood, right? Because they're very different stories, like all the way through <laughs> all of those. Uh, so yeah. it sounds like something which um, you know maybe it's kind of similar in a way to to some of the stuff you've written. Yep. Absolutely, I love. Uh, I've read the first two Books of Blood, and I literally just bought the third one uh, earlier today. Um, but I love that about his work. Like you never know what you're going to get with a Clive Barker story. And that's kind of what I'm trying to work towards is to, to have that ability to um, like, with, I just watched midnight meat train the other night and I oh, just love, love how you, it's like this like thriller type horror movie, but then it like completely by the end of it, it's like, what the hell? I wasn't expecting, <laughs> you know, this ancient race of subterranean you know, people eaters, it just totally throws you off. But I love it that about it because mm -hmm. it's so well done. And like the tone is so different by the end of the movie. Um, but that's what I, one thing I love about Clive Barker is he just and I, I think that's why he was so po he's so popular. He is so popular. Um, yeah. Thankfully, he's still with us. <laughs> I'm, but. I'm not going to lie. When it comes to Clive Barker, I'm more a fan of his dark fantasy than I am of his horror stuff. I'm, and I'm the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more of yeah. than his fantasy stuff. Yeah, and Magica and Weave World are two of my favorite books by Clive Barker. Yeah, and I, I, I met him a couple of years ago. He was super nice. So I'd love Mark, to meet him someday. He uh, seems like a really cool guy. Oh yeah. Could you imagine? I, 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 I would be blown away. I, I was, I was yeah. totally uh, starstruck when I met Heather Langenkamp and um, Brad Dorif. I, I couldn't speak. <laughs> so Clive had like a whole bunch of his like original paintings for sale too. Oh wow! His original artwork, but I didn't have that sort of money because <laughs> it was at a convention and I was getting other signatures and stuff. But would have been cool to get one of those. Yeah, would have. So Josh, tell yeah. us about some of your fav your favorite authors besides Clive Barker. So, I 
obviously um so actually growing up i wasn't a big reader i had i had a really bad adhd so i was like the class clown always making people laugh i was a smart kid but i wasn't a big reader until like my senior year i finally um i picked up the green mile i loved mm -hmm. stephen king's movies uh growing up those were like a huge thing of mine i was a cable tv kid mm -hmm. and they were always playing on tv and you know as a mainer i mean you i mean he he lived like you know, a little over an hour away from where I lived. And uh, right. yeah, I mean, I, so I finally read the green mile and which isn't even necessarily like a horror book, but mm -mm. I, so, you know, I grew up on and I started reading kind of like strictly Stephen King. I did read um, a couple of the, like a Michael Crichton book, which was like um, pirate latitudes, which is a really good book. But so most of my, most of the books I've read, are Stephen King. So I'd, I'd probably say, you know, since I've read, read him the most, he's probably one of my favorites, but I have been venturing out into other areas, um, not just horror, but I like, I've gotten into Clive Barker the past couple of years, um, really enjoy his work. Um, and I mean, other than that, I really, I jump around a lot. I love Brom. I've read probably oh, yeah. two or three of his books. Um, he's kind of like, horror fantasy you know he's kind of in that realm of of clive barker too where he kind of does what he wants mm -hmm. um i really love that lost and, gods is one of my favorite books that he's written yeah yeah i've read um i read krampus which totally mm -hmm. blew me out of the water i wasn't expecting that at all um, it's such a fun ride I, that whole book yeah so I, I you know i love his work um but other than that, I mean, I, I jump around so much. I really don't have, I mean, I like Jack Ketchum. Mm -hmm. uh, I've read a couple of his works, but I, I don't really necessarily have a favorite. If I, if I had to say, I'd probably say Stephen King because I've read the most and he's probably right. the biggest inspiration um, I have, which it's very cliche, but it's just, it's just the truth. Yeah, I that's fair. Lie. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that that's fair. You you're exposed to what you're exposed to and what you have access to, so that's totally fair. If I can yeah. make a suggestion, though, if you like short stories, yep. uh Tyler Jones does a really great job of disconnecting his stories and writing in different styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, From I used to know. Uh, I used to be a little bigger in the um, indie community, and yeah. so a lot of the names that are in the indie community, I don't really associate with them much anymore. But I. I know all of them and mm -hmm. I've, you know, talked like I had a podcast a couple of years ago called writers on wax and it was about writers and basically their relationship to music and how music in inspires them or like their history with music mm -hmm. or do they, what do they listen to when they write? And I had a long list of different authors that you've probably heard of all of them uh, that I either had on the podcast or I was planning to have on the podcast until I just got, so burnt out. I was doing like three or four episodes a month and oh, wow. kind of just took over my life. And, um, but so, yeah, I, I've, I've read, um, I think it was Criterium I've read by Tyler. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was a good, uh, kind of like, uh, I think it was on a, like a book about addiction and stuff like that. It was really yeah. good. So yeah, I, I have to check he, out more of his stuff. He wrote, there's a short story specifically called boo that was just, fantastic nice and i'm not going to ruin anything but if, if you look up nothing else you got to read that story it's great great yeah i will mark you're awful quiet i'm just listening <laughs> <laughs> um so just thinking about uh, short so you know you, you do a lot of short stories um do you find that as something which you would continue to do more so than trying to do like a full-length novel or is it baby steps towards that? Or is it just like, it's just an idea dump and that's just the best format to do it in, like with ADHD, I got it. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kind of yeah. like these little segments um, rather than having to put, you know, a three, 400 page novel together. Yeah, that's a great question. I honestly, um, so I think the reason most of my books so far have been novellas is because um, my attention span is so short with, you know, my ADHD and stuff. And honestly, I am blown away by people that can sit there and write 
three, four, or 500 page books uh, because not only my attention span doesn't allow for that, but like, I don't know. I just, I don't have the ability to write in a lot of the fluff that is required because most of those books that you read that are that long um, generally have probably 35 to 40% filler that doesn't necessarily need to be there. It does build up the story, but um, when you're talking about the meat of the book, um, you know what I mean? Like the same thing with like some movies that are just so long and drawn out. Yeah. Um, a lot of it you don't even need to have. And stuff like that just irritates me more than anything. So like with my own writing style, I feel like if I can write the story, like length doesn't matter as long as I'm telling the story I wanted to tell. And I feel like I'm getting, hitting all the notes, all the character development is there. And that's one thing I'm pretty proud of is I, I'm really good at developing characters in a short amount of time, mm -hmm. not by telling people, but by by their interactions, um, by their thoughts. Like I can build up a character in a very short amount of time. Um, right, it's, and, sh it's show, not tell, right? I mean that. Right, and I feel like uh, one thing I've taken from Stephen King is I love his his work, but sometimes <laughs> I'm like, if I'm reading his book, I'm like, God damn, dude, I don't need to know all this shit. You know, and I don't need to know uh, like, where they went to college and all and every detail about their their hundred percent agree. That's why yeah, that's, the stand took me three I, years to read. So yeah. like, you know, at least King like he acknowledges that. He's like, I've got verbal yeah. diarrhea. So that's when you need a good editor sometimes. And like yeah. like it's it, it is a great book, but there's like so much of that that's just like I don't really care about this character's life with his yeah. wife for the past 10 I, years or whatever i'm like it does nothing for the story it's like the writing is great yeah. but it, it, it just does nothing for the story it's just I, like it, you could just write it in one sentence and it would be I, the same i feel like if josh wrote lord of the rings we would have gotten one solid hour and a half movie and it would have been fantastic well, well, <laughs> well make things as Joshua was saying, make things as long as they need to be, but don't make them yeah. longer than they need to be. Just right. to say, you know, I'm great at writing, and this is I'm just going to like explore other characters. Take those characters and maybe put it in this other novel or something. I don't know. Right. <laughs> I'm not. A writer. I, 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 you know, what the fuck do I know? Nothing. No, we that's know, right. I, mean, I that feel much. like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I feel like too, like having read so much Stephen King, I've kind of learned what not to do because I, I, when I read something and I'm just like, okay, I, I use a lot of my own experience as a reader. Um, because I feel like I'm like the bottom, bottom tier reader. Like I'm not one of those people that could read 20 books a month. I am like the slowest reader of all time. And when I read something, I know it's a good story when it, I can read it and I can bust through it. And, and then I learned why did that story keep my interest? And that's the things I've learned as an avid reader when I'm, when I write is to, in order to, if it doesn't keep my attention, if I'm not feeling excited when I'm writing it, the people that are reading it are probably not going to be excited either. So that's why um, I'm drawn to short stories, but mm -hmm. uh, I am actually working on a Western novel. It's not a horror Western, which it was originally going to be, but it's a Western. And that is actually, I think, going to be my first full length novel. Um, wow. It's already at like 40,000 words. Um, and um, I've been, it takes place right after the Civil War and like literally months after. And it's kind of like um, a, a, like a ro on the road story of some people that, um, you know, it's it's around the time when this like the Civil War ended and the Confederates are kind of disbanding and they started to you get the early days of like the KKK and they're kind of like causing a ruckus down south and these people are just trying to get um, they're he heading westward in a in a covered wagon and they just want to go live in peace after the war and they keep finding these little factions of uh, former Confederates who were going after them anyway and so that is kind of like my first i mean my toes into you know into the full length novel and um but it's it's kind of it's it's i'm not doing the filler thing also i'm writing like every chapter i feel like is is needed and every chapter is but i'm i'm also trying to dip my toes in the 
like writing longer fiction because I do want to actually, I don't want every one of my books to be a novella, even though some of the greatest books of all, like I just read Planet of the Apes uh, a couple months ago, and it was such a good book. And it's literally less than 200 pages. And some of the older books, like I think we kind of, we, we've been talking, like we talk about as writers, like we're in like a novella, revel- like a renaissance where mm-hmm. these great horror novellas are coming out. But honestly, a lot of the books from years ago are novellas. You know, they're under <laughs> under 200 pages. We just don't realize it because the way they printed them, they were smaller paperbacks back in the day. Um, it, if you look at maybe one of the most influ- influential um, horror writers, he did all short stories and novellas. Um, and, of course, Stephen King, uh, you know, borrowed a lot from him, too, which is H.P. Lovecraft. Yes. And that's all short yeah. stories. Right. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah. He did. But also, uh, Joshy, with, with you saying about uh, your western, that's kind of like real life horror to me, right? So yes. Whenever you look at like war or slavery or anything that represents kind of like the worst of humanity, <laughs> that's Very real much. life horror, you know. Um, Very and much. That, and that's I, more yeah. scary to me than ghosts or goblins. I, or, I agree. Or but that's a good segue, Mark, because we oh. I asked Joshua. Uh, when we started talking about him coming on the podcast, what his favorite genre of horror was. And he mentioned he likes ghosts and ghouls. I mean, you pretty much like all horror as long as it's not extremely gory, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it it can be gory, but it it has to serve the story. And like, I love Bone Tomahawk. And that movie was like, I have to cover my eyes in certain parts of that movie. And I think you know what scene I'm talking about, but... um, I can but say if it's I don't. Well done, and it fits it. the story. Oh man, it's a it's actually a horror western, um, and it's star studded, which I'm not usually a big fan of, but it's very good and it's very gory. Um, it, it's almost worth a watch. It's almost like a John Wayne movie crossed with Cannibal Holocaust. Okay, really, it is. Yeah, <laughs> very well, good. I've never seen. Kurt I've Russell's never seen like Kit. the main actor. Yep. Um, what, what do you call him from? Insidious. Uh, Patrick Wilson's. Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, yeah. Even like David Arquette and even mm-hmm. the guy from. Uh, uh, I, I'm gonna. I, I sound like an awful horror fan. The guy from Rob Zombie movies. Um, the clown guy. Oh yeah, yeah. Sid Haig. Uh, Sid Haig, yeah. <laughs> I was say, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's in it for at the mm-hmm. very beginning. It, it's very good. Um, very good horror western, and it's the writing is fantastic. This, but anyway, I digress. But it's it, uh, when it it's almost, done right and it fits the story. It is yeah. it is absolutely it's good to me, and I I, I can deal with it. Um, and if I have it to almost, away, I can. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it almost feels like a um, Django and Chain, the the Tarantino version. Yeah, like you know, with Kurt Russell, etc. But um, hmm. it kind of feels like that. They, those could be like companion pieces too. Yes, That's, like a lot of Django Unchained is his kind of retelling of the thing <laughs> in a western, and uh, Bone Tomahawk is almost like a cannibal movie mixed with the western. So interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I brought up a list, Mark, that we are going to okay. talk about, and this is going to be quite polarizing, I think. Well, before we do that, let me go to the bathroom. Okay. Josh, you need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> I have a bladder of a small child. He does. He's, he's, almost, he's almost 50, so you'll have to forgive him. No, but to your point, I do like... Um, I do like almost... It, it, most horror. Um, yep. You know, I, I kind of avoid the more extreme stuff like the human centipede and hostel where it's yeah. just like torture porn stuff. But I generally like, um, you know, I like to be surprised too. Yeah. Like I said, with like Midnight Meat Train, like I right. like like things like that that take a twist. Um, you know, Hereditary was one of my favorite more recent horror movies because yep. – I didn't watch it until much later because I was like, ah, it just looks like, you know, family. And it, and the, the advertisements kind of steer you in a certain direction, the, you know, yep. the promos, and it does that on purpose. And yep. and then when I first watched it, I was like, it it had an effect on me, and I love yeah. that kind of stuff, you know. And it, that's sorta, the type of stuff I look for. 
that's like the the new movie Late Night with the Devil. I'm really excited about it because it looks so great, but I'm yep. just so worried that it's getting all this hype and it's just going to suck. Yeah, I, that one does look really good. I have seen a couple that are coming out next year. Uh, Long Legs and mm -hmm. um, yeah, that one. Uh, there's a couple that look that are pretty exciting to me. I have heard one of the earliest reviews of um, Late Night with the Devil. They said it was it just blew them away and it was so good. And um, I'm hoping that's the case because yeah. I really have high hopes for that. So between okay. you and I and the fence post, and I'll edit this part out, but um, I actually have may have an opportunity to screen that movie. So I'm so excited. You have no idea. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> anyway, Mark, Definitely. you're, you're back now. Huh? Yes, yes, oh, yeah, I'm I'll, back. I'll tell you all about it, Josh, I promise. But before, but before we yes. move on, I have a couple questions for... Okay. Is it Josh or Joshua? Is it doesn't matter. matter. Both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the big J. There we go. <laughs> um, so one of the things I always ask whenever we have um, authors on, because I'm very much, although I like books, I'm more of a movie guy. Mm -hmm. So do you have any, whenever you're writing something, or do you have any ideas about any of your stories in your head? Have you been like, I'd like that actor or actress to play that character, or I'd like this person to direct this? For any, Ooh, any wow. of the stuff that you've written. Um... That's a great question. Honestly, um, I don't think I've really thought that far ahead on it. Well, so maybe like a year or so ago, we, I had a, a buddy who, um, we had actually talked about, he has like a small film, like a production company. And we had actually talked about, um, scratches being, cause he read it like right before Christmas a few years ago and he, he loved it and he loved like the simplicity of it. And, mm -hmm. um, he was like, man, this would be a good a good movie and it'd be an easy movie to make. And he was like, um, so we actually, he, he wrote up the screenplay and we went through this whole process and we started talking about who we would like um, to play some of the characters. And I think the furthest I got was um, there's a, the character um, who's the grandfather in the book scratches. Uh, his name is George. And I thought, um, Clancy Brown would be an awesome oh, uh, that would be great. person to play that because yeah. he's just such a dynamic actor and he's so well known. And mm -hmm. I mean, he has like, he, uh, like he's, he's the type of person that if I see Clancy Brown in it, I'm probably going to watch it just because right. he's done so much. And he's also, he's also big into like doing big budget, little budget. Like he's been okay. in so many movies that I mm -hmm. think he would be an awesome fit. And as far as like the mother and son, um, I mean, I really never really got that far into, um, into it. Like, I mean, they could, the, the thing about my characters is most of the time I keep them very indescript. Like I, I like, I don't describe like their looks or because right. for me, I feel like people can relate to characters more if it's not like a little blonde white boy with blue eyes. And it's like, if you just say he's a kid, he's 12 years old. That could be anybody. Anybody reading that book could see themselves in that character because of their their attributes or their hobbies. And a lot of people were like, oh, man, I even like women who read the book, they're like, man, I was totally a conner when I was a kid because I loved horror movies and I loved mm -hmm. uh, reading horror comics and stuff like that. And um, I think that's one thing a lot of readers that read my stuff do appreciate is you can you can see yourself in the characters because I don't go into a lot of uh, physical attributes. Like, I don't have the, what is it? Stephen King's famous for the uh, the jacket, the certain type of jacket that he, and like, people even like, it's like this trope thing that he has, like the Cambroy or some sort of jacket that he always <laughs> talks about. And, um, but that's the one thing I'm, I'm proud of. So like, you know, I have never really thought much about it um, as long as it's good and as long as they don't, completely changed the story you know like i watched uh stephen king's the mist show mm -hmm. and it was nothing at all like the book or the original movie and it could have totally been something completely different and i just i don't like when people do that when they take so many liberties that they create their own like you don't know better than the original author so please stop trying to you know do that and if you want to just make your own movie do it so that's one thing i would i would say is 
if someone ever wanted to do it, at least try to stick to 90% of the original story because that's what people, that's what people like and that's what they want to see, you know? Right. And, and you can talk about, um, Dan O'Bannon, right? Whenever he wrote Alien, he wrote Ripley as a character that could be a male or a female, right? He never specified. Mm-hmm. So then it comes down to the director, like who's the best person for this role? And obviously Sigourney Weaver knocked it out of the park, uh, but yep. could have easily been a guy. Yes, and so, I feel like it causes, especially nowadays, like it causes more controversy than than it's worth when, like, you like like the whole thing with, um, I, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Dark Tower series. That was one of the big series that I read, the Stephen King Dark Tower. That once I read that, I was like, okay, I'm really gonna try this writing thing out and. Um, you had this character, Roland DeShane, who mm-hmm. everybody knew this. He's this gunslinger. He's from this kingdom, um, blah, blah, blah. But we had like eight or nine books with this guy. And he was very descript. We knew what he looked like. And then when the movie came out, it was uh, Idris Elba. And it's like, okay, I understand like, you know, representation and all those things are important. But this is not a character that you can necessarily just like change that much and still have people connect with it because the only people going to see the dark tower are people that like the books, the dark tower, let's face it. And, and otherwise nobody cares. And it was so far from the original story that it wasn't even the dark tower anymore at that point. And that's what I'm afraid of with my own work. And I love Idris Elba and stuff, but I feel like that's why I like people writers when they don't necessarily have to have a specific type of, character or attributes or physical Mm -hmm. traits um, because it's so much easier to adapt them. But when you have someone like Roland Deschain and then all of a sudden it's this gorgeous human specimen of Idris Elba and not this like gritty, um, you know. I I, I think some characters have to have some inherent values because that's what their character is, right? Um, And some don't. Like, you know, people, oh, the little mermaid's black. Okay, well, it's it's a mermaid. Who cares? <laughs> you know right, what I mean? That's right. nothing That's, to do yeah. with that character. But if, if I'm going to remake 12 Years a Slave and have a white guy as the, the slave, well, that doesn't make any Precisely. sense. Right? Yeah. So and that, that's exactly what I'm getting at is I don't, I'm not like the. You know, I'm not one of those people that's like, oh, it's woke and now it has a black guy instead of a white guy. But there is some times when, like you mentioned, like, right. you know, if it's you, literally someone in history and like you couldn't have Martin Luther King be played by a white guy, even though I'm sure they'll try it or they have tried it in the past. Yeah, I you mean, know what I, mean? I, I think it's just like you have to <laughs> you have to use like common sense, right? There are certain yeah. characters that have certain traits because of that's who they are, right? Yeah. And that's. Yep. That may be based in their gender. It might be based in their race. It might be based in their sexuality. It might be based in whatever. But if you change that fundamental thing about that character just to, I don't know, appeal oh. to a wider audience or something. No, 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 no. You don't get to have this conversation, Mark. Yes, I do. No, you don't. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a you, straight no, 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 guy. No, no, no. You don't get to have this conversation. I'll tell you why. Why? Because we've talked about Dean Kuntz's Phantoms. And you yeah. are you are Love okay. It's bullshit because they changed not only the main the last name of the main characters, they also changed the age of the younger sister. I she don't was a care child. About that. Okay, I don't care. So you don't get to have this conversation because you're okay with that. Just sit down, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway, I, like I mean I think you just have I think you just have to use common sense. And I think there's some yeah. characters that are malleable. You can have them as whomever. And the and, best and if, actor or actress for the job is probably the best actor or actress for that role. But sometimes there is some roles which are more specific. And that's what it is. I mean, it's not big. Like, yeah. nobody should be getting, like, really, like, oh, my God. That Now, you can talk about is there too many white heroes in movies and books. And you can have that conversation. But if you're writing a book... Right, and you have mm-hmm. a, a defined character that has some history, or, or 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 something about their character that's linked to, like I say, their gender or their race or whatever. Because you're trying to write real characters, 
um, then I think that's the way it should be portrayed. Yeah, and I, I, as a, as a using the same the same like so the Dark Tower series I mentioned Roland Deshane. Well, if there's a there's an amazing character uh, Susanna, um, mm-hmm. yeah. Susan and Susanna. She's she's actually like a split personality, yep. um, but she's a black woman who is also in a wheelchair because she loses both of her legs and um, which I think she gets run over by a car, yep. um, which is all connected in the story. But if they were to race swap her and change her, because her her race is very intricate to her story, it's very important. It um, it's very and it makes her who she is. But if they were to race swap her into a white woman, I would be just as outraged as when they race swapped Roland because it just doesn't make sense in the context of the story. And that's the only time that it really bothers me because I don't care who plays what and who does who, unless it's a, like a very specific, like you said, if it's a specific, yeah. like well, in their life, like you said, uh, from um, Ripley could have been played by anybody, anybody, yeah. any race, any gender, it doesn't matter. But um, there are certain times where it has to be, it should fit the character to tell the right story. And most people, I feel like, understand that. And they they, yeah. they want that because they want what they want the authentic story, not the and I, I feel like that's oh. somewhere that, like something Hollywood is doing really bad lately. Although I will like, say they're messing it up so bad. I will say for the past two thousand years, uh Western culture has been like, Oh, Jesus was white. <laughs> oh God, here we go. Yeah, that's a whole other <laughs> no, podcast. No, but no. It, that's, a, that's a whole true. different podcast. That's was a whole though. different. We're talking about race swapping. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Jim Caviez, like, like Willem Dafoe, and you know, they, all on guys. <laughs> well, look, I mean, like, and and what's funny is it's like they're overcompensating because Hollywood has this history of making every uh, indigenous character like John Wayne or a white guy, and then. Um, you know, blackface was a huge thing back in the day, oh. and now they're like, okay, we have like a like 40, 50 years that we have to make up for, so we're going to overcompensate and and just irritate everybody when it and it makes no sense whatsoever. Like, there's so many amazing um, stories uh, written and told by black people featuring black people that we should be telling, but what they want to do is take the same garbage that's already been told a hundred times, like these old Grimm's fairy tales. And just race swap it and say, "Oh, look how progressive we are." Well, that's no. You're still telling white people stories. You're just race swapping them. Like, why don't you go and yeah. find some of these amazing, talented um, black storytellers and but, tell their stories? And and so, that's how lazy Hollywood is. Is they want to. Here's, here's a weird bugbear that I have about like movies. Like you have like the Marvels or Wonder Woman or you have Black Panther, right? In the movies, yeah. You have to get like a woman director or a black director or whatever. I'm like, why don't you just get the best director? And by the way, if um, you know, Infinity War is directed by a black person, that's great. I mean, like, why do you have to do that? It seems like like pandering. <laughs> to me. Well, sometimes it is, but sometimes, like, I think, um, and I, I, I get Denzel that. Washington. I feel like Denzel Washington put it put it very articulately when he said. The reason it needs to be a black director for certain types of stories is because it is a brain. black story. It is their story that he is telling, and um, and and it's a very specific type of story that needs to be told. So you want someone doing that, and it and a lot of times, like these uh, like Infinity yeah, War yeah. and all these things, like they're just a generic. They have like teams oh, and teams oh. of of people, you know, oh, yeah. what I mean, it, that are doing this, but um, it's but it's like. Yeah. Black Panther is not, uh, or Thor. Like you don't have to have a white director do Thor because Thor is a Norse god. You know what I mean? It's no, like but that. Black Panther is a very specific. Like Black Panther oh. is actually in Africa, and it's actually like, um, you know, it was actually it is a it is a black heavy story with a predominantly black cast because Wakanda is. Right, like right, an African right. country, even though it's no, no, even though no. it's like uh, you know it's. Uh, I I, I, it's I guess my and it's it's I, not real, but yeah, I guess my point is the director of Black Panther should have more access to direct non-specifically black type of characters, right? And 
I, I, I kind of feel like that's always the case. Like Wonder Woman always seems to be directed by a woman. And I don't necessarily think that you need a woman to direct Wonder Woman. She can direct lots of things, whether it's a, a male or whatever. It doesn't like, like I said, Thor or whatever. Um, so it's just like the best person for the job, right? No, I understand. I think, I think what, I think what it really boils down to is if the movie sucks, mm -hmm. they probably had the wrong person for the job. But like Black Panther was a well loved movie and it got oh, yeah. a huge, uh, it was popular and it was loved and, and people of all walks of life really enjoyed it. But then you have the Wonder Woman movies, which <laughs> kind of fell flat, at least the second one. I've never oh, no. seen any of them, but the second one was, was really, the, really bad. And the first one was and, good. Uh, the, the first yeah, one was so. okay. It was the fish out of water thing. The yeah. second yeah. one was actually really misogynistic against women, which is weird because yeah. it was written half written by a woman. I'm like, <laughs> I, I yeah, don't. That's not that. the first time that's happened, Mark. Look at um, oh, oh god, what the slumber party massacre. Is that a, oh, is that what? Is no, that no, a, no, no, no. I, I, I just killer, killer. Am I confusing my movies? No, no, Slumber Party Massacre, but I disagree with that. I don't think that was anti-women. I think Wonder Woman 84 is kind of anti-women. <laughs> like, like, whenever I watch it, I'm I like... It was the, I believe that was the same director that did the first one as well. Yeah, yeah. it's... Um, what's her name? Patty. But anyway, like, 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 I enjoyed the first one, but the second one, like, I don't know what the fuck's going on. Anyway, this is not a superhero podcast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's no, let's, go, let's talk about know. some ghosts, shall we? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I well, brought up a... Uh, sorry, Jim, before you do that, um, uh, oh, uh, right. Josh, I also want to ask... Do you have like a top five horror movies that you like? Yeah. Um, so it's, I, I'm horrible at that, but I feel yeah. like I have some that I've seen so many times that I can automatically just put them into that category. So I'd say not in any particular order. Um, my five favorite ones that I've seen so many times. Um, I'd say. The, and it's kind of like surprising and kind of corny, but the the first, um, the miniseries it, um, mm -hmm. very near and dear to my heart. It was yep. I watched it yep. live on TV when I was like six years old in 1990, and oh my um, God. that really sparked a huge love of the genre for me. And I've seen it probably a thousand times just because I used to have the VHS growing up, yep. um, mm -hmm. and so that is probably one of my in my top five, I'd also say Hereditary, um, a more recent one. Yep. Um, I just love the way that movie made me feel, um, made me feel all kinds of ways, and I I really enjoyed it. Um, I also really loved going to the more indie uh, found footage type films was Grave Encounters. Um, yeah. Yep. I really loved that movie. That one caught me by surprise. I actually just bought the DVD recently. And I didn't care for the second one as much. No, but the second one, like second how... one was, was, was crap. The first one's awesome. Yeah. They yeah. they did such a great job with like lampooning the you know the uh, ghost hunters <laughs> show. Like and, they and... did such a great job, and then they like it, it's like a found footage um, version of the remake of House and Haunted Hill. Yeah. Yeah, And I, the thing I like about it is, just to go a little bit further into it, is um, it's it reminded me of the way I write, is there's no, there's not a second wasted in that movie. It's like, yep. like sometimes found footage, I love the genre, but you got to wait 20, 30 minutes before you get any sort of exciting thing or any sort of, it's all character building and corny, stupid stuff that doesn't need to be in there, like, in my opinion, most found footage movies could be an hour long because you could cut out so much of it. But yeah. um, that one really, from the second it starts to the very end of it, it's all fun and creepy, and it, right. and it just it, even though it's like satire and somewhat comical at times. So um, I, I I think the I brilliance, it, you know, I think the brilliance of that movie is like the setup. The first thirty minutes is a comedy, right, and it's a parody. Mm -hmm. And then once yes, it turns it into horror, 
then it's like, okay, this is change, right? So it, it's it's like yep. it's not funny anymore. And I think it knew that's exactly great. what it was doing. And yep. that's one thing I love about it is is and even like the horror aspects of it, like you know, the kind of like the CGI warping faces and stuff, yep. even though at times it could be corny, um like just I am a sucker for a haunted asylum. And some of the imagery they had in that movie with like the hands coming through the walls and the pulling of the hair and, uh, you know, T Dog getting pulled into the, uh, it was T Dog or T? I think T Dog is from the Dead. But, um, the camera guy gets pulled into the tub and like of blood and just there's so many amazing scenes. Um, and just the progressive, uh, how they slowly over time, they kind of start to lose their minds and they don't know what's real and what's not. And then they get the, I mean, it's just such a well done movie. And if, if somebody hasn't seen it, um, that's listening, please check it out. It's, it's probably one of the better found footage, yep. um, so, movies out there and it's, it's, they don't waste a second of time. So definitely check it out. Um, yeah. So that's, that's definitely one of my favorites. Um, um I'd also have to say, Oh, two more. Um, so I have, uh, I'm trying to think of what I own. Oh, so I do love the original Pet Cemetery. That's mm-hmm. another one that really is near and dear to me because I watched it so many times as a kid um, and it terrified me. Um, Zelda especially was freaky as hell. Zelda. Yeah. Oh my God, Zelda <laughs> haunts my dreams. Um, yes, Zelda is the creepiest and um i've i've recently started really digging uh i'd say the fog is probably another one um love it. By john carpenter i yep. really i love nautical horror i love i love that combination of like pirates and oceanic because the ocean itself is just like the ultimate horror setting because the ocean itself is just terrifying and mm-hmm. anything could be in the ocean and we just don't know it and I just love the aspects of um, how, like you know, the the these ghosts come out of this mist and stuff like that. Um, it, it's just such a it's just such a wonderfully told yeah. ghost story, right from the yeah. from the very beginning. Right, you get the ghost story at the start, and whenever yeah. you like, whenever you listen to it, um, it's all about time, right? He talks about the time, it's this time, and. It's five minutes to midnight, and it's this, and that that goes through the whole movie, right? Whenever um, Tom Atkins, etc., is uh, going to the door and like he's going to get killed, but no, the, yes. the time goes to one o'clock, and then he's okay. So, um, I, I just think that is a masterpiece. From so, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely, and eight, I mean anything with Adrian Barbeau is like okay, like oh, I'll I'll, I'll be meeting her in a couple of months. <laughs> <laughs> no way! That's amazing. Be convention so. That's, that's, that's so cool. She's at Spookala, right? Because I didn't see yep. her on the guest list for Spooky. Yeah, she's come to Spookala. Yeah. So I have that's one awesome. ghost movie I want to ask you about that I already know is not on this list that I I rarely hear people talk about that I thought was fantastic. Have either of yeah. you seen Ghost Dancer or Grave Dancers? Yes. And Grave Dancers? I don't think so. That that was one of those. What what was the Masters of Horror? No, it wasn't Masters of Horror. I thought that was what it was called. I thought no, was no, 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 no. It, it, it was another, like, they did the, these releases of these movies. Yeah, under Showtime a, did it. But it wasn't Master. No, it's a full length movie, Master of, of I, I know. But I always thought it was that. I thought that was a, the film series. No, it, it was something else. Grave Dancers was okay. I enjoyed it. It's oh, from good. 2006. Yeah, after I'm, dark, I'm looking at it right after now. Dark dark check it. After Dark. After yeah, Dark. That's, that's what, what it is. It was. Eight films to die for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Awesome. It I I loved that movie. I thought it was great. It 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 has a really strong flatliners type vibe to it, but it was done really really well. See, for along. me the sweet the sweet spot is like five stars to like seven stars. If a movie is rated like that, to mm-hmm. me that's like absolutely perfect, and it's probably going to be really good and and right in my wheelhouse. Like especially with horror movies, if they're rated like around five six stars. To me, that's probably a quality movie, and I'm, I'm definitely... Yeah, it's, it's probably a, a shorthand for, like, a 9 or a 10. <laughs> right, yeah, no, to me, like... Right, because it gets, like, uh, like... downvoted a lot because people don't understand horror. 
<laughs> right. You know, that's exactly right. Like, uh, it's all about the feeling to me. It doesn't have <laughs> to be like the acting doesn't have to be perfect. But um, like, I think there was one I watched recently. Um, what was it? Ghost Story. It was an A24 movie with uh, oh. you know, Ben Affleck's brother. Yeah, KT um, Affleck. And it, yeah, and uh, it was like that was horrible. Rated. Oh no, it was it was highly it, rated, and I was like, "Cool, I'm gonna watch this." I've seen. I've you've never thing. seen of somebody eating a pie for like 15 minutes in it. No, nope, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I literally <laughs> my anxiety spiked during that scene because I was so really? annoyed, and I was like, "Dude!" And I literally kept skipping ahead, and I'm like, "What the hell is going on? This is." stressing me out because i'm just so irritated at watching this woman eat pie for i swear to god it was a 10 minute scene yeah. and it wow it i i ended up stopping watching it i gave up on it because i'm like you know this could have been really good but some of the like she listens to us an entire song of that her husband made after he died like literally sat there and like okay this is the type of crap that i'm talking about with like movies and, and books when they just add too much to make it like fill it out and i'm like that but, i gave up on it and but it yeah. was highly rated so i'm like that's exactly my point is like sometimes what you know yeah. it doesn't have it, to be super popular for me to like it you know like like art house say. stuff like or slow burn right art house yeah. slow burn slash yeah. whatever um to me uh, to make it enjoyable um the characters have to be engaging um, whether there's nothing going on and it's just their discussions and you have to have a good payoff at the end. Yeah. So you can the have a very one that I, yeah. the witch is one that I love and it's, it's a slow burn and it has some of those, some of those like slower mm -hmm. scenes, but it, it has a great payoff. The characters are amazing. I love the setting. Um, I love time period pieces. That was probably one that I would have put in my top five if I thought of it, but I love the witch. Uh, and, I that almost, one that was done right, you know. I feel yeah, like. I almost, I like, I really like the witch, but I almost don't think it's horror. I think that I yeah. think it's drama. It's a period drama with horror elements. The way I yeah, see it, but I really like it, and I like what um, Eggers does. I mean, with the lighthouse and stuff. I mean, <laughs> the lighthouse what's is funny about that. Movie, what's funny but, about that movie, The Witch, is I, it was one of my worst movie theater experiences I've ever had because if you remember the 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 music in it is like mm -hmm. this long drawn out extremely jarring like strings right and um when we were watching it in the theaters we literally had to plug our ears it was so uh it made us so uncomfortable like my wife literally went out and grabbed napkins and plugged her ears because it was <laughs> so loud we actually went and told the people running the theater were like, yo, you need to turn this movie down. Like, we are in pain watching you, this movie. You were the theater um, Karen. Yeah, <laughs> and it was like, I need to speak to the manager, man, because yep. you're about to blow up my eardrums. But it was, but I love them, because it's not like that when you watch it on, on, like, streaming or the DVD. But for some reason, it was, like, one of my worst theater experiences, even though I absolutely, I love the movie. I love the, uh, I love that whole time period with, like, like the the crystal and you know yeah like that whole early settling um because i'm from new Puritanic england and horror. it's yeah yeah i i love that whole time period even though it was like completely messed up i just think it's like bef early america before like things were um you know the indigenous people were here but it was it's usually told from like the the settler experience and the colonizer experience and um, I could just imagine how unsettling it was to live in those little tiny Puritan villages um, on the borders, you know, in like the middle of nowhere. And I don't know. I just, I've, I've always well, liked it, that. It, um, especially if you're a woman. <laughs> yeah, it harkens back to yeah. what Mark said earlier. That, that sort of horror revolves around the evil that people do to each other. So it's real. Exactly. It's yep. not, it's not something that's intangible. Yep. Absolutely. I mean, that's what made the crucible so, t so utterly terrifying is it, it was all about what they did to that woman right yeah there was nothing supernatural at all about it it exactly. was all just like just like the lottery was, yeah I oh mean, that was that that story really blew me away um, yeah i read we had to read that in my literature call it my literature class and i was like holy crap like this yep. is this is what you can do with storytelling and that's yep. another short story that um is so impactful but mm -hmm. like you just don't like 
when people can do that with like a tiny little bit because that's such a short story but it's like yep. wow like that it, it, i still think of it to this day yep. like that's the brilliance of like short story like you said like you don't have to have this 700 page book to tell a good story you know what i mean yep. like you know and that's I, that's I one, yeah that that's a great story, man. I, I love it. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to go to the bathroom again. Okay. Sorry, it's my bladder. Oh, Jesus Christ, Mark. Oh, whatever. You should just talk to you. A... I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might want to get your prostate checked, Mark. Yeah, how about you? <laughs> no, <laughs> ew. Yeah, so. But anyway, I always um, find I, that's one of the things I liked about Slewfoot. Well, that, that, that book by Brom is not. It's not a fast pace. It's very, it's very much a slow burn, in my opinion. But it's more about the evils that people do to each other, rather than the supernatural yes. aspect. And that's what made it mm -hmm. so, so engaging, in my opinion. Yep. Yeah, and that's one thing I've noticed. Um, a lot of people say about uh, my work when they read it is, it's very human, and it's mm -hmm. you know there is some supernatural elements, and there's some things that I you know I talk about with like monsters or like ambiguous things but um like there's a story um in my in hunger for death called uh a room full of toys and that mm -hmm. story is based off of a true story that someone in my town told me about because they heard i was a horror author and they're like they invited me over um and it's about a story about this rich family in like the early 1900s they had this huge mansion and up in their attic, they built this tiny little closet-sized room where whenever they had parties and guests come over, they were entertaining people, they would put their child who was intellectually disabled and they would hide him away in that room and wow. lock him in there. And there's a lock on the outside of the door to this day and leave him there so nobody would know they had this child who was intellectually disabled, you know, instead wow. of like putting them in an asylum, like was the the thing to do they would just stick them in their attic with no heat no no air Jesus. conditioning you know obviously and yeah so i added the supernatural element to that really human story that was actually based on a true story and um so sometimes my the very human aspects of my stories are accompanied by a supernatural element where i take some liberties to do that and that's where um that's one thing I, I really like about my stories and a lot of people like about my stories is even though they're horror and sometimes there is supernatural elements, they're based off of very human experiences. And like with, um, like I said, Hereditary was one of my favorite yep. modern day movies. Um, that's a movie about a family who's just dealing with trauma. And, you know, if you took out the supernatural elements out of it, um, it's still like it's still just as effective you know what i mean because mm -hmm. everything being done is by humans living breathing human beings right um and that's to me is like what's so impactful about certain stories and stuff like that i love it you know i was i was telling you earlier when we were chatting about how my, i had family up in maine right or up yeah. and around wilton i don't know exactly where but um the first the first horror book that i ever remember reading was we went to spend the week with my great grandparents who lived up there and my great grandmother was an avid reader so her we slept in her attic of course and she just had these stacks of books and she would tell us whatever you want to read to go to bed just grab it it doesn't matter and <laughs> of course i grabbed jaws oh yeah peter bensley it was the first first horror book i ever read and i loved it yeah Man. that's a good one Man. Mark, shut up. Nobody asked you. Um, we have an additional question, by, uh, by the way, uh, from our Facebook group. Mm -hmm. Okay, please. So, um, previous guest on Hellraiser aficionado, Robert Holt, yes. asked, what do you drink while writing? I bet it's either, it looks like whiskey or coffee. Um, so... I guess it depends on on the mood I'm in. So I I used to be a heavy heavy smoker of the ganja, and then when Ooh. I quit smoking, I was clear headed, and that's when I started writing. But because I am a like my family is like chemical 
users on both sides, um, I switched to drinking and I actually got big into bourbon and, mm. and also I, I started picking up like IPA and stuff and, and, um, beer. Um, but honestly, I, I like, I definitely, I, gen, I do like to drink when I write, um, it kind of like takes the edge off. It helps me kind of, it puts me in this little, like, Gives me this just enough buzz to get me going and get me writing. Um, you up. Yeah, it loosens me up and kind of takes mm-hmm. me out of my real world shit that I'm, you know, thinking about all the time. Um, but I also like coffee. I'm a I'm a huge I'm literally a coffee addict. I drink coffee all day up until right before bed. I make a pot like at least eight cups of coffee, like well, like eight ounces of coffee. Um and I drink that before bed because I do have ADHD and it actually calms me down. I like tea, but I do I do like uh, a, a stronger beer um, to drink. It, it it all depends. I mean, I, I during the day now because I'm doing more writing during the day when my son is at school for a couple hours, um, and I just drink coffee. Um, I don't drink during the day. I'm not like a raging alcoholic. <laughs> I, I actually don't even like to drink, but. Um, when I do write, I do like to have a little warm and fuzzy feeling in my tum tum. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. so Robert, there's your answer. Yep. There you go, Robert. So yep, shall we, shall go, we buddy. move on to ghosts? Uh, yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm not the, I don't so do the, I uh, the cocaine stuff. Like, <laughs> like you know, I, need to, I need to do the cocaine and mumbo number five diet. Like Stephen King did. <laughs> yeah, right. you'll never direct. Um, what's it called? Jim. What? What did Stephen King direct? Uh, with uh, Emilio Estevez. Yeah, the um, uh, Maximum Overdrive. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> that he can't so remember anything the... about it. <laughs> <He's just> like... <laughs> like, I, I've always thought that if you got to do it right, you got to do it yourself. And he's like, <laughs> "Yeah, Maximum Overdrive." <laughs> yep. Oh man, it's so funny. You got to love him though. He so... he just was like that time period where it just. You know, yeah. horror was amazing. The 80s, man. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So I found a list on yardbarker.com. I've never heard of this yeah. website before, but let's let's go over this. These are the top 25 ghost movies of all time. Mm-hmm. So, Mark, we're going to start Do off it. with a movie that I'm willing to bet only you've seen. Okay. If, if you've seen it. It's from 1953. <laughs> it's called Yugetsu. Uh, no, but I have heard of it. You get to. It's a Japanese. I've not, never heard of it before. Japanese yep. ghost movie. Yep, it's it's by Kenji. I'm going to butcher this last name. Mitsuguchi, about an ambitious oh, potter you, you who is persuaded to. by the spirit of a deceased. Yeah, uh, he's persuaded by the spirit of a deceased noblewoman to leave his wife and child. He does so for a time. And then realizes his folly. He returns home to his family where he unexpectedly encounters another ghost. Uh, okay. And that's that's where the description ends. So I, I like oh, where it has like, I like where this is starting. Yeah, it has like an eight point two star rating. So mm-hmm. uh, yeah. And you know what's funny is a lot of those to, older gonna... it's from nineteen fifty three. A lot of those older movies yeah. have very good ratings. Um because yeah. they were able to do a lot with what they had. So I, I'm screenshotting all these, by the way, because I'm going to look them up. And um, it's on good. it's on Max. It's on Plex. So anybody listening? Oh, good. Then um, I'm... Yeah. Oh, good. So that. Jim won't watch it then. Check that out. No, <laughs> that one I'll check out. That one definitely. Jim, what, what is the so, um, earliest movie you've watched? Uh, it was Haxon. We've had this conversation. Oh, yeah. That's a crazy one. It's like apart that. From, uh, apart like from the that. devil and stuff, yeah. It's apart from that, I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> Poltergeist. <laughs> yeah, Trip, no, that Trip, is not Journey true. To I've the, seen Alien. Is it Journey to the Moon? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <A> silent film. <laughs> uh, so okay, number two okay. on this list is a modern classic that everybody either loves or hates. It's 1980s The Shining. Oh yeah. Um, I, I disagree with uh, what you said. I think it's okay. I don't love it or hate it. 
Okay, well, that's fair. It's a, it's I like personally a comfort love it. Movie I thought it was me. a great slow burn. Yeah. yeah. It's not a I movie like that I pay much attention I'm, to when it's on, but I enjoy it. Yeah, I'm a Kubrick. I'm a Kubrick lover. Um, I like... I mean, despite being so different from the novel and far as far as character yeah. development and stuff like that, like I feel like King hated on it just because he was the author and the character development took a, a much different turn than the book. But the book, yeah. I mean, had its it was good, but I think it's extremely overrated um, at, at times. Um, like when people are like, "Oh, that's my favorite book of all time," because uh, when you watch the mini series that came out of The Shining. You can, yep. it's actually very, very uh, sticks to the book a lot because I think I think he yep. was even like a producer on that. But yeah, he was even he appeared flat. in that like, miniseries. Yeah, like he, I mean, a fire hose turns into a snake, a, th- a, a yep. CGI snake. Okay, and you want to tell me that's scarier than what Kubrick did? I, the, the thing with Kubrick's movie is it was about atmosphere. It was about mm-hmm. um, making you feel the isolation that they were feeling and. Well, it's um, not even just that. With a lot of his shots, he just makes you uncomfortable. Like he no, draws shit right. out so that you the, get uncomfortable. I, I, I totally, yeah. I totally agree with Josh. I, I think what he nails in that movie is that isolation. That isolation yeah. that you yeah. can feel that you could go insane. Um, in that, yeah. you know, it's probably a good pandemic movie, right? But it's also, <laughs> um, I think, the downfall of that movie is also one of the best things about the movie. Um, Jack Nicholson, um, who is great in it, but he just seems insane from the start. And I think that detracts yeah. from uh, the overall feel of the movie. He could, because he already seems like he's totally on the edge, which is different in the book. I, I don't know. I disagree because I had that feeling about that character from the beginning of the book. But that might be because I saw the movie before I read the book. The, the, the book does a lot about him coming to terms with all the stuff that he's done and yeah. turning it around. Whereas like the first interview that Jack Nicholson has with the guy in the hotel, he just like <laughs> comes off as fucking nuts. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a great performance, wrong. but it's different. The other thing is too, is um, the, the book does a lot to develop Jack's character with his like growing yeah. up with his family trauma with like his dad coming home and just being a short fuse and beating his mother and all those character development things aren't in mm-hmm. Kubrick's version. And I think that's why King, like he was so excited when he got a call from Stanley Kubrick, but at the same time, when he saw how much he changed it, um, it, I think I can understand. Like I said earlier, as a writer, if somebody changed my story that much, it would, it would upset me. But at the same time, mm-hmm. it's it's goddamn Stanley Kubrick, and I don't care if he anything he could do anything to my movie if he's putting his name on something I wrote. <laughs> God bless him, like that's so, what I say. And you know, I think King was just a, a little too harsh. It, so Josh, Josh, I, Josh, Josh, I've got a question for you. Right, so yeah. um, in the book, um, yeah. Jack Nicholson's character. Um, goes oh, right he goes from damage to being healed to being fucked up by the house or the hotel mm-hmm. but then eventually he becomes the hero right because he blows it up yeah in the movie he is the antagonist yes there's no redemption arc for him so no. if somebody took one of your characters that had a redemption arc and changed yeah. it to just being the antagonist. Yep. No matter who's directing it, would you be okay with that? Or maybe. Um, that's a great question. Um, because honestly, I mean, you could actually say that about my two first novellas that we've been talking about that Jim has mm-hmm. actually read. Um, uh-huh. Where in the first uh-huh. book, my character George is the antagonist, and he's this absolutely vile character that you grow to loathe but in the prequel story he is actually this redeemable character that you actually grow to like and he's he's uh and that's why it it, it switches people's but so i understand like if he was to just make him 
this awful, cocky right, character so he, in the prequel. So, yeah, so he flips it. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he flips it, and he gets rid of the character development. I can definitely see why that would bother King. Um, I'll, I'll because you you're right. You're absolutely right. It's like it's a total flip-flop of, like, this guy who has this – he has this past. Like, you don't even explore any of – of Jack Torrance's past in the movie. And it's just more or less Jack Torrance being this, you know, you hear about him hurting Danny's arm and all these yeah. things, but you don't learn about the past trauma, which, you know, nine times out of 10, there's always some sort of childhood abuse and things like that. When there's somebody who's that messed up as an adult. And that's a big part of the human, the humanity of that character, and I can totally understand why King was upset about that, and that was one of his biggest gripes. Like he wasn't like this is a bad movie; it was just what he did to his characters, um, you know. And right. you know, Wendy, Wendy went from being this like strong woman who who like protected Danny and like stood up to Jack to being. Um, Shelley Duvall, who was basically this, <laughs> she was like this whimpering. She just like was scared all the time and very like weak, and and I can totally understand. Um, you know, yeah. if we're talking about the Kubrick movie mm -hmm. um, and not the miniseries, because the miniseries yeah. did a much better job. It did of of the developing the characters, even though the kid that played Danny was completely insufferable, and I wanted everything bad to happen to him. <laughs> I hate to say that, but as a writer, I can I can absolutely empathize with King and his. His, yeah. um, well, let's go regardless step... of who it was. So, yeah. so I, I, I know. Step... Not... Wait, wait, hang, hang on, Mark. We, we yeah. got to go a step further because we have to also talk about he got he got screwed in the sequel too. He waited what thirty years to write a sequel to this, and then they made it into a movie. Yeah. And they used the ending of yeah. the book, the The Shining, for the ending of the sequel. Dr. King, King, King liked so that. Weird, first. yeah. He... King liked it though. When you, I, I thought yeah, it was garbage. To sleep, it's like no, no, you might find... think it's garbage, but King liked it. And they, but then they did the same thing. They cut out so much character development. They made the main character, uh, what's her name, Aubrey, I think. Um, yeah. They made her so much older than she was in the book, and that character of Rose the Hat was so less menacing. We're, like, we're going to talk about difference between a book and a movie in what I've watched. Um, but the only, <laughs> okay. the only other thing that I would say is that um, the other thing that King was really, I think, upset about is that the ending of The Shining, the way he wrote it, mm -hmm. ended in flames. Yes. And the movie yeah. ended in ice. And not and only he, that, he does this thing where um, in the movie The Shining, Kubrick, he kind of took a swing at King because when um, Dick Halloran is going up to the up to the, the resort, mm -hmm. you see a red, I think it's a red uh, beetle, like a the car, um, right. mm -hmm. tipped over on the side of the road in a car accident. And in the movie, the beetle that Jack drives in is a yellow. And in the book, it's red. So it's kind of like his way of saying, like, he wrecked the red beetle because that was King's version of the beetle. You know, and, and a lot of people, like, I've seen so many documentaries and read so many things about it. Um, so that's a very, like, particular thing. Um, but it's one of those things that he kind of like, you know, was like, Hey dude, the, this is my thing now. Like, yeah. you know, and it really is. I mean, honestly, it like is, the yeah. book is great and it's well loved, but the movie, I, I, the movie is like, like took off like way because I, it was Kubrick. And I mean, Kubrick is, right. can do no I, wrong. I, I mean, and Jim brought up <laughs> Jaws where I think Jaws is a much better movie than book. Absolutely. I agree. I did read the book and there's a whole subplot in the middle of, uh, the wife and um, Cooper, Cooper kind of yeah. like having like this mini affair thing. And that just took me out of yeah. the whole story. I was like, but, See, it did, but it I can did... Sorry. So no, no, I was, I was just saying it kind of took me out of the story and I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like <laughs> you know, it, did, it, just, it did the exact it, opposite for me. It, it, it made me appreciate it did. It made me appreciate the character of Ellen Brody because I've always thought in the movie, she was a completely underutilized character. Well, she's, she's yeah. not important. Right in in the movie, correct. In the movie, until yeah. you get to number four. Yep. <laughs> yeah, the, the sequels. I mean, we won't even talk about the sequels. But this <laughs> right, we could do, we could do a whole three hours on the Jaws we, we, series. 
the oh, only man. the only thing in the book, right? So the books go a different ending, and they do very much yeah. like the Moby Dick stuff, and like blah 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 blah. And the exploding mm-hmm. oxygen doesn't make any sense either, but I think it works on a movie. It works well. for the movie, yeah. Um, but the only thing that I think Spielberg might have spent a couple of minutes on is with the mayor, right? Because the whole thing in the movie, they just look like horrible, horrible people by keeping the beach yeah. open. But yeah. in the novel, he's being like leaned on by mafia to keep the beach open, which yeah. gives him a yeah. little bit, like it you know, loosens his character a little bit. Like no, you're not no, like, just I'm, like, what the fuck are you doing, dude? <laughs> I like to hate him. The only thing, I mean, I liked that I did not like him in the movie. Uh, but remember, he's still the mayor in Jaws too. So, well, we're not talking about. And you don't really. Now, Mark. And the only he's almost he's almost like the antagonist in the movie because yeah, he he's the whole reason things are staying. But like he said, they don't explore the reasons of why he's being pushed so much. But right. It, right. instead of putting the weight on the mob and whoever the people are behind him, which he just looks like doesn't incompetent, totally unnecessary side plot, but. Right, it it puts more of the like the weight on the mayor for being which which, I mean, is totally, I mean, it's not really stereotypical because it's actually like pretty close to reality where, um, it's a monetary thing where he doesn't want to lose the tourism and stuff, and it right. it makes way more sense to have the mayor just be like, no, we're gonna keep our town running. I don't care how many people die with the shark attack and and uh, yeah, so the whole side plot. I- I, I, I think what undercuts that too is that he's like when he's whenever he's in the hospital with uh, Roy Shatter's character, he's like, yeah, my kids were on the beach too, right? Yeah. So it's like, are you just stupid? Like, <laughs> like, are you just like you you had your own kids there? Like, I can get him sacrificing all these other people because he wants to make money, whatever. But you had your own kids there. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Sorry, Jim. Go on with your next one. It's okay. The next one is going to be uh, a choice for sure, Mark. Mm. Are you ready? Yep. I'll give you a hint. 1980. The Changeling. George C. Scott. Yep. Yep. Oh yeah. So this is this, this, this is a polarizing film. This is. A it's polarizing not polarizing. Film for us, it's John. not. Pol- it's not polarizing. It dude. is for us. It is for us. Yeah, you just <laughs> you just have no taste. I think George C. Scott is a terrible actor. Josh? Um, depends on the role, but I feel like this is the type of movie that it's all about the atmosphere. Um, I feel like maybe it could have been pulled off better by somebody who knew like the genre that they were working mm-hmm. in, but I still feel like it's like it's effective from the jump from the get go when the, his his wife and son, spoiler alert, um, are killed at the very beginning, and it's like, wow, okay, now I'm invested in this movie. Um, you know, I mean, you've only had if that's really a spoiler because the movie's like forty four something years <laughs> to watch it. It's just so, in the first two minutes. <laughs> yeah, but I feel like it's, and then it is one of those movies like you got to stick with it. It is a slow burn. It, it feels very antiquated, even though it's from 1980, like the same. I think it's the same year The Shining came out, maybe by within a couple uh, months or something. But yeah, yeah. Um, you got to stick with it. It has those. Um, it has the type of horror that I love, which is like you don't really see a lot um, at first. Like you just get those creepy, um, you know, the things, ha- the noises in the background, and the things happening behind the scenes, and like the, the ball is a very big um, part of the movie. Um, I like that type of horror. Uh, because mm-hmm. you're kind of like you can play the skeptic the whole time until the big reveal happens and you actually okay so this actually is something going on it's not just it, you know and you it's know, as much a ghost it. it's as much a ghost story as it is uh, a mystery that he's unraveling yep. all the way through and Absolutely. I think some, right. I, I think that's some of the best ghost stories where it's about my favorite ghost movie is uh, The Legend of Hell House, which is all about discovery of what's going on. Um, Absolutely. But what I'll say about uh, The Changeling, 
it, 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 it really has some sort of, uh, some of the scenes in it are just very iconic. And I think they influence a lot of movies going forward. Like the part where oh, they absolutely. have the um, psychic come in and they're, she's doing automatic writing, mm -hmm. right? That's right. very yeah. much like the psychic that comes in in Insidious. In every horror movie, in later. every ghost movie, there's a psychic that that comes in and they have that sort of. And Legend of Hell House had it before and stuff, and that was, that was one of the parts. But I think the way that they did that, the way they shot it, I think really influenced a lot of um, future movies. I feel like uh, American Horror Story took a lot of. Uh, beats from that movie too because like they had like a red ball and this old uh kind of like a haunted house mansion type feel to it um and it was kind of like but like the little things like that like i do i definitely feel like um like you said a lot of it was kind of like one of those earlier movies that inspired uh mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of later stuff and i um yeah i love that about it it's it it was it was one I watched later in life. I think I only watched it maybe two years ago or something, and it it moved right up to one of my. I can see why it's very revered among horror people, and I can also see why some people don't like it because it is older and it is a slower burn. And um, if you don't, ha if you if you have that mentality of like get to the get to the frigging point, and mm -hmm. and you like the more modern horror movies, um, I could see why you wouldn't care for it but it's well worth it to finish it and to sit through it put your phone away and just yeah. chill and watch the movie because it does have some really creepy stuff to it it, um, it also directly inspired one of the best Japanese um, ghost movies with Ringu yeah yep. because they have the whole well uh, part in that where they find the well and they're trying to get stuff out of it which I guess uh, the writer of Ringu the comics uh, picked up on. So, Jim? and for anyone listening, it's uh, it's on Peacock, it's on Pluto, it's on Tubi. Check it out. It's definitely it's a longer movie, but it's really good. Uh, it's it's not actually it's like a little under two hours, but it's worth it, worth a watch. Absolutely. So next next up on our list is a modern. Well, I don't know about modern, but it is it is a more recent classic. It is 1999's The Sixth Sense. Oh yeah, this is the that, only I mean, that's M Night a, that's, Shyamalan movie where the twist actually was fantastic. Yeah, I think that's one of like one of, if not the best, M Night Shyamalan movies. Uh, it was mm -hmm. definitely one that when it hit the scene, but you know, it was like it was still during the times of the internet, but it was early enough to where you weren't spoiled. And right. spoiler alert. Um, it it is one of those movies that you you don't expect what happens to happen like by the end of it and um, and also it has some really great scenes in it and and I mean it has one of my favorite actors in it uh, Tony Collette who was in Hereditary oh, she's yeah. absolutely amazing in that movie you should have won an Oscar and, for that yeah and I mean Bruce Willis like it's one of his few ventures into horror uh, which. It's it's kind of horror, kind of like psychological thriller, and that's the thing is it's yeah. like you don't really know it's horror until like later on. It, it kind of feels like you know it's it's ambiguous. You don't know if this kid is just nuts or if he's really seeing these things, and that's what I like about it. And that's I really feel like that's and that director's. I mean, that's his really showing what he could do before he yeah. he started falling into the the Hollywood. Like he just, I think that was his peak, and it's one and of his earliest movies say, too. So, I have to say that the Donnie Wahlberg in this film was completely unrecognizable. Oh, absolutely. He, he I had no idea that was of, him until um, many, many years ago. If you've ever seen uh, the Dreamcatcher, he reminded me of uh, mm -hmm. what was his name? Dubbitz. Uh, Doggett. Dubbitz. Yeah, Dubbitz yep. or whatever his name is. That That's is. what he reminded me of, and it, you totally don't know he's, yep. yeah, he's Donnie Wahlberg, and uh, yep. I really feel and like the whole fantastic. cast was absolutely incredible. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yep. It's a slow burn, yep. but it's one of those movies that it's definitely worth the payoff, um, yep. and and it's so well done because once you see it, once you once you know what's actually happening at the end, you're like, wow, how did I not notice that? How did I not right. see all these things? 
coming, but it's 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 very well done to the point where you're like, wow, okay, I guess I guess I'm not as observant yeah. as I thought I was, you know. <laughs> and then you rewatch it, and you always find something new. Like, oh yeah, I should have guessed that. I should have realized yeah. that nobody was talking to him. You know, you you realize all of these things when you rewatch it. You're like, oh yeah, I somehow missed that the yep. first time. Mark? Another one I give him credit for is The Village, which is kind of polarizing, but I really feel oh, like God. that was one of those movies that had, it was the period piece, but it kind of wasn't nope. at the same time. And it and it has one of those twists that he became famous for, which he lost that, really, he lost sight of it at the end. Like, he was so good at his twist, but um, yeah, I really liked The Village um, when, the, it, when I first the saw it. In and... the, the twist in The Village is what killed it for me. Really? I thought that yeah. was such a cop out. I thought it was such, and a that's cop why out. I think it's so polarizing. Like, is because that that right there is the point. Is the 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 twist is what divides audiences. I think um, you either love. I it was a hundred. I was a hundred percent bought into that film until she jumped the wall, because I knew yep. exactly what was coming. That was not <laughs> so, a surprise at all. Uh, so oh, wow. so the, the issue with uh, Shamalma Ding Dong. Um, is that if you go in expecting a twist, you're always looking for it. Yes. Maybe, I think after yep. a couple of movies, that's what everyone was... It was like, I'm Sherlock Holmes. I'm yep. going to watch this movie, and I'm going to try and figure out the ending before the ending, because it's going to be a twist. Right. Um, I mean, that's kind of what he's known for. I haven't I haven't yep. seen some of his movies, but, like, uh, yeah, I, I agree. Like, I mean, some of his later movies aren't really, like, old and... Um, and stuff that he's adapted, like he just adapted the Paul Tremblay novel, which is also polarizing. Either you loved it or you hated it. But oh, listen, um, that I, I have I have thoughts on that. If you've never listened yeah. to the podcast, I have thoughts on that. I hate. I did not enjoy the book at all. The movie is so much better than the book. Yep, I, was I agree. So, I hundred percent agree. I did not. I put off watching the movie because I did not like the book. And then I finally saw it when it came streaming on Peacock and I thought it was fantastic. Yep. I think the movie did a way better job than the book. The book uh, yep. was, yeah, I'm not, a, I mean, and honestly, he's a very well-liked, well-known author, um, mm -hmm. but uh, most of his books are rated like he's very polarizing because most of his yep. books, even though they're popular, they're rated like just, over three stars like it's it's pretty yeah. it's pretty incredible like that an author when an author could be that polarizing but still mm -hmm. pump out works that people read and people promote and it's but that was one i was really surprised of i liked the movie even though i and I, it may be that i listened to the audiobook and the narrator was absolutely awful uh when that in in the cabin at the end of the world she did a yeah awful job um but I, I did. I didn't hate the movie. I was surprised. Um, yeah, I agree. So, but I yeah, will say it's... with with Tremblay, I've read four Tremblay books, and he's two for four with me. Two of them I liked. Two of yep. them I did not at all. Yep, I think I've read two or three of them, um, yep. and they so were okay. I think the biggest thing for him was he was he was blurred by Stephen King um, mm -hmm. early on. So, Head with, Full of uh, Ghosts is fantastic. Yeah. Yep. That one is fantastic, and the disappearance at Devil's Rock are the two that I really enjoyed. Yep. Um, yeah, I've read Head Full of Ghosts Mark? and the uh, Cabin at the End of the World. And yes. They were like mid tier for me, um, but yep. I I respect what he does, and I respect his drive, and he's still pumping up books, yep. and he still has a huge fan base. So good for him. Yeah. Like people obviously Agreed. connect with it. Yep. Yeah. So you ready for the next one, Mark? Mm-hmm. The next one is from two thousand and one. And it's a Kiyoshi Kurosawa movie. Do you want to guess? Hmm. Ringu. No. No, or it's the Grudge. One. It's, uh, it's what? Pulse. Pulse I yes. do not like Pulse at all. Pulse. I've not. I've not seen the the J horror version of this movie. I've not. I've seen that and the remake. Um, the, the original is better. The remake's yeah. way bad. Um, it's. <laughs> it's, it's a, so to me, it's just like okay, well, we're trying to do Ringo, but we're trying to do it with the internet. Right. Um, I. It's just a little too slow for me. I I I just wasn't engaged with that. But definitely watch the original if you're interested. Don't watch the remake. Mm -hmm. The remake's fucking balls. That's kind of like oh 
I think with the exception of the ring, um, that's generally my take on uh, like remakes of like Japanese or East Asian movies into American movies. Like they're almost always so much worse than the original. Um, like the ring was actually very well done. And I remember my first experience watching it in the theater. I was in uh, Mississippi at, at AIT when I was in the army and I was watching with a, with a on base with a, a room full of people. And it was just so fun. And they were like, we were scared shitless. And, but then you watch like movies like the grudge and some of those other remakes that are just piss poor, awful I, remakes that don't need to exist. And, I always recommend if you can if you can deal with subtitles, if you can, or even find a dubbed version, watch the original. Part two coming soon.